Bhante Tisaranina Saha Pancha Silani Yachami Dutiampi Ahang Dante Tisaranina Saha Pancha Silani Yachami Patiampi Ahang Bhante Tisaranina Saha Pancha Silani Yachami Motrasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Sama Sambhasa Namo Arahato Sama Sambhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Samma Sambhutasa. Buddham Saranam Gachami. Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Sangham Saranam Gachami. Sangham Saranam Gachami. Tutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tutiyampi dhammam saranam gachami. Tutiyampi dhammam gachami. Tutiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Tutiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Isarana Gamana Viti Thang Ama Bhante Parna Tipata Ve Amani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yani Parna Ramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yani Adinna Dana Ramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yani Adinna dana veramani sika padam samadhyami. Kami so vicha chara veramani sika padam samadhyami. Kami so vicha chara veramani sika. Musavada veramani sika padam samadhyami. Musabada veramani sika padam samadhyami. Surame raya manjapamadakthana veramani sika padam samadhyami. Surame raya manjapamadakthana veramani sika padam samadhyami. Imani pancha sika padani silena sugatingyanti. Sīle na bhoga sampadā, sīle na niputhiṃ yanti, tasmā sīla viso dhāyī. Sādhu, sādhu, sādhu. 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 Advice from Nandaka. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savaji in Cheta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's bar. Then Mahapadapati Godi, together with 500 Bikunis, went to Blessed One after paying homage to the Blessed One. He stood at one side and said to him, Venerable Sir, sir let the Blessed One advise the Bikunis let the Blessed One instruct the Bhikkhunis. Let the Blessed One give the Bhikkhunis a talk on the Dhamma. Now, on that of were taking turn in advising the Bhikkhuni, but the Venerable Nandaka did not want to advise them when his turn came. 
on the eighth important role laid down by the Buddha when he established the Bhikkhuni Sangha stipulate that every fortnight the Bhikkhuni should request the Bhikkhu to send for the purpose of giving them an exhortation. M.A. in a previous life, Venerable Nandaka had been a king and those Bhikkhunis had been his concubine. He wanted to avoid this turn in advising the Bhikkhuni because he thought that another Bhikkhu possessing the knowledge of past lives seen him giving ex an exhortation surrounded by the Bhikkhuni would think that he still could not separate himself from his for former concubine. But the Buddha saw that Nanga Nandaka's discourse to the Bhikkhuni would benefit them and thus he requested him to instruct them. <laughs> then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, how stern is it today to advise the Bhikkhuni? Venerable Sir, it is Venerable Nandaka turn to advise the Bhikkhuni, but he does not want to advise them even though it is his turn. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Nandaka. Advise the Bhikkhunis, Nandaka. Instruct the Bhikkhunis, Nandaka. Give the Bhikkhunis a talk on the Dhamma, Brahmin. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Nandaka replied. Then, in the morning, the Venerable Nandaka dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Savati for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Savati and had returned from his alms round, after his meal he went with a companion to the Rajaka Park. The Bhikkhunis saw the Venerable Nandaka coming in the distance and prepared, prepared a seat and set out water for the feet. The Venerable Nandaka sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The Bhikkhunis paid homage to him and sat down at one side. When they were seated, the Venerable Nandaka told the Bhikkhunis, Sisters, this talk will be in the form of questions. When you understand, you should stay we understand. When you do not, do not understand, you should say, we do not understand. When you are doubtful or perplexed, you should ask me, how is this, Venerable Sir? What's, what is the meaning of this? Venerable Sir, we are satisfied and pleased with the, with the Master Nandaka in that he invites us even with this much. Sisters, what do you think? Is the eye permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Sisters, what do you think? Is the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, impermanent or imper permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this well as it actually is with proper wisdom. These six internal bases are impermanent. Note 13, 19. They have MA. They have seen this with the wisdom of insight. Good, good sisters. So it is with the noble disciple who sees this as it actually is with proper wisdom. Sisters, what do you think? Are forms, sounds, odors, flavors, tangibles, mind objects, permanent or impermanent? Permanent, venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering or happiness suffering venerable sir 
is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this well, as it actually is, with proper wisdom thus. These six external bases are impermanent. Good, good sisters. So it is with a noble disciple who sees this, as it actually is, with proper wisdom. So this follows the same uh, wording as the the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the discourse on non-self that the Buddha gave to the five bhikkhus, the five uh, ascetics who were his first students. Except it switches the instead of talking about the five aggregates, it talks about the six senses. This is interesting. Um, you'll see this is a common sort of pattern. The six senses and the five hind- the five aggregates are in some ways interchangeable. So at, at the moment of an experience, an experience can be an experience of seeing, an experience of hearing, an experience of smelling, tasting, feeling, or thinking. And at that moment, the five aggregates arise. This is what the, where the five aggregates come in. They arise together at the moment of any of the six senses. The mind is a little bit less precise or less less uh, clear, but less simple. But with uh, the other five senses, there's a physical, of course, and then there's the feeling, there's sanya, there's sankhara, there's vinyana, there's the five aggregates arising at that moment. So the five aggregates are not us. It's not of the body or this being. It's the five aggregates. The five aggregates are at that moment. So when the Buddha taught the, the five uh, ascetic, the five ascetics, he taught them the five aggregates. And sometimes that's because uh, the the audience is more attached to the mind, because the five aggregates talk more about the mind. So you use the five aggregates to talk to people who are attached to the mental side of things. Some people are attached more to the physical, and so you talk about the six senses now the six senses are mostly physical I mean, most of the topics are physical but it's really talking about the same thing that is a reason that's not perhaps the only reason but it is a reason they give to talk about the six senses over the five aggregates um yeah the the wording is the same they've just switched the six senses so i guess the remarkable thing is that uh, the six senses and the five aggregates are different ways of talking about the same thing. And of course, I mean, the remarkable thing here is the the, do, the teaching on non-self, which is a very simple and, and easy to understand argument of or, or explanation of why things are non-self. It's logic. They're impermanent. If they're impermanent, then they're also suffering, right? Suffering here means suffering because of impermanent. And suffering here doesn't mean necessarily they cause you pain because of their impermanence, but it means they can't be sukha. Sometimes you call things dukkha simply because they are not sukha, which sukha means happiness, meaning this they can't satisfy you. Suffering is often translated or explained as inability to satisfy. That's one of the qualities of dukkha. You can't find happiness, and in fact, you do suffer if you try to find happiness. If you try to find satisfaction in things, you just chase after them more and more, and you're never satisfied, and you become less and less content, and um, more and more reactive and reactionary. And so, the impermanent things are suffering, or are unsatisfying. And those sorts of things, it, it it's an essence of why they clearly are not or should not be regarded as self. You might even say it's just a bad idea. It's it's a it, what the, the point isn't exactly whether uh, it's true that things are non-self. That's not the most consequential part of this. We're not it's not an intellectual exercise to have the right answer. It's an it's a deeper understanding that you shouldn't that this is not the right way or not a good way because it really doesn't matter what is true. It, what matters is what you think. If you think of things in a certain way, does that lead to happiness? If you think of things in a 
a certain way does it lead to suffering? No, of course, seeing things the way they actually are in truth is what leads to happiness. That, that's the case, but that's the, the important point. And that's why you need to see it for yourself. As they say, see it as it actually is with proper wisdom. Because the important thing is that you you get the attitude, no, no, these things should not be regarded as self. I mean, it's not even so much a thought like that. You just, your perspective just changes. And you stop looking at things as self. You, you understand that that sort of clinging, that sort of uh, way of looking at things simply leads you to stress out about them and to get upset and to suffer. Sisters, what do you think? Is eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, mind consciousness, permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir, why is that? Because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this well as it actually is with proper wisdom, thus. These six classes of consciousness are impermanent. Good, good, sisters. So it is with a noble disciple who sees this as it actually is with proper wisdom. Sisters, suppose an oil lamp is burning. Its oil is impermanent and subject to change. Its wick is impermanent and subject to change. Its flame is impermanent and subject to change and its radiance is impermanent and subject to change. Now, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? While this oil lamp is burning, its oil, wick, and flame are impermanent and subject to change, but its radiance is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because, venerable sir, while that oil lamp is burning, its oil, wick, and flame are impermanent and subject to change. Its radiance must be impermanent and subject to change. So too, sisters, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? These six internal bases are impermanent and subject to change. But the pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor pain, neither painful nor pleasant feeling that one experiences in dependence upon the six internal bases is permanent everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. Go to DCI, no, that, Venerable Sir. Why is that? Because each feeling arises in dependence upon its corresponding condition. Note 1320. Uh, the coming together of the eye forms in eye consciousness is eye contact, and this is the primary condition for the arising of feeling born of eye contact. With the cessation of the eye, one of the factors responsible for eye contact is removed. Thus, eye contact ceases, and with its cessation, the feeling born of eye contact also ceases. End note. And with the cessation of its corresponding condition, the feeling ceases. Good, good, sisters. So it is with a noble disciple who sees this as it actually is with proper wisdom. Paragraph 10. Sisters, suppose a great tree is standing possessed of hardwood. Its root is impermanent and subject to change. Its trunk is impermanent and subject to change. Its branches and foliage are impermanent and subject to change. And its shadow is impermanent excuse me, and subject to change. Now, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? The root, trunk, branches and foliage of this great tree standing possessed of hardwood are impermanent and subject to change, but its shadow is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because, venerable sir, the root, trunk, branches and foliage of this great tree standing possessed of hardwood are impermanent and subject to change. So its shadow must be impermanent and subject to change. So, two sisters, would anyone be speaking rightly who spoke thus? These six external bases are impermanent and subject to change. But the pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant feeling that one experiences 
independence upon the six external basis is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because each feeling arises in dependence upon its corresponding condition. And with the cessation of its corresponding condition, the feeling ceases. Good, good, sisters. So it is with a noble disciple who sees this as it actually is with proper wisdom. Sisters, suppose a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to kill a cow and carve it up with a sharp butcher's knife. Without damaging the inner mass of flesh and without damaging the outer hide, he would cut, sever, and carve away the inner tendons, sinews, and ligaments with the sharp butcher's knife. Then, having cut, severed, and carved all this way, he would remove the outer hide and cover the cow again with that same hide. Would he be speaking rightly if he were to say, this cow is joined to this hide, just as it was before? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because if that skilled butcher or his apprentice were to kill a cow, etc., and cut, sever, and carve all that way, even though he covers the cow again with that same hide and says, this cow is joined to this hide just as, just as it was before. That cow would still be disjoined from that hide. Sisters, I have given this simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning. The inner mass of flesh is a term for the six internal bases. The outer hide is a term for the six external bases. The inner tendons, sinews, and ligaments is a term for the delight and lust. The sharp butcher's knife is a term for noble wisdom, the noble wisdom that cuts, severs, and carves away the inner defilements, fetters, and bonds. Sisters, there are seven enlightenment factors. Note 1321. M.A. He undertakes this teaching on the enlightenment factors because wisdom is not able to cut away the defilements by itself, but only when accompanied by the other six enlightenment factors, wisdom being equivalent to the investigation of state's enlightenment factor through the development and cultivation of which a bhikkhu, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now, enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. What are the seven? Here, sisters, a bhikkhu develops the mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. He develops the investigation of state's enlightenment factor, the energy enlightenment factor, the rapture enlightenment factor, the tranquility enlightenment factor, the concentration enlightenment factor, the equanimity enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. These are the seven enlightenment factors through the development and cultivation of which a bhikkhu, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of the mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. When the Venerable Nandaka had advised the bhikkhunis thus, he dismissed them, saying, Go, sister, sisters, it is time. Then the bhikkhunis, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Nandaka's word, words, rose from their seats, and after paying homage to the Venerable Nandaka, departed, keeping him on their right. They went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, stood at one side. The Blessed One told them, Go, sisters, it is time. Then the Bhikkhunis paid homage to the Blessed One, and departed, keeping him on their right. Soon after they had left, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, just as on the Uposada day of the 14th, people are not doubtful or perplexed as to whether the moon is incomplete or full, since then the moon is clearly incomplete, so too those bhikkhunis 
are satisfied with Nandaka's teaching of the Dhamma, but their intention has not yet been fulfilled. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Nandaka. Well then, Nandaka, tomorrow too you should address those bhikkhunis in, exact, in exactly the same way. Yes, Venerable Sir. The Venerable Nandaka replied. Then the next morning, the Venerable Nandaka addressed Sitra repeat uh, uh, 4 to 14 above as far as 277. Then the bhikkhunis paid homage to uh, the Blessed One and departed, keeping him on their right. Soon after they had left, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhuni because, because just as on the Uposaka day on, of the 15th, people are not doubtful or perplexed as to whether the moon is incomplete or full. Since the moon is clearly full, so too those bhikkhunis are satisfied with Nandaka's teaching of the Dhamma and their intention has been fulfilled because even the least advanced of those 500 bhikkhunis is a stream enterer, no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment. Note 1322. And may she who has last, uh, she who was last in regard to good qualities had become a stream enterer, but those whose intentions were to become one's returners, non-returners and arahants, each achieved the fulfillment, the fulfillment of their intentions. Because of these results, the Buddha named Venerable Namdaka the foremost bhikkhu in instructing the bhikkhunis. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. Bhante, it's not quite clear to me that why they had, uh, why Vedra Nandaka, or why the Buddha told him to teach them the exactly the same thing again. Why do you think that they, did he do this? Well, it's not so significant that he taught them the same thing exactly. Um, the question is whether people need to hear more than one teaching. Uh, or, or I guess you could say they need to hear the same teaching more than once. But it, it does point out that it's not information. It seems strange to us because we're, we're used to thinking of a, dumb, a, a talk or a, a lesson will be for gaining information. And this isn't actually for gaining information. And he isn't actually telling them something that they haven't heard before or don't know. They, their answers make it pretty clear that this is something they've heard before or certainly is something they've heard before the second time they hear it. But the point, again, isn't for information. The point is for guidance. And hearing these things guides you. Hearing them again and again guides you again and again. It's more like a guided meditation. Yeah, establishing the mind, their minds in the uh, anatta lakana, or, or all three uh, characteristics. When the bhikkhunis are being taught again, um, it's kind of like the cowhide. So um, the bhikkhunis are like impermanent, I guess. It's like they're not starting from the same vantage point as the first teaching. So I guess it's yeah, not really repetitive in a way, too. That's a really good point. The first time they heard it, their understanding would have been on one level. The second time they hear it, they'll be able to, to hear it in a different level. Absolutely. But you'll notice that when you go back and read or study or listen to a talk again after having practiced. Like people who have studied Buddhism before practicing find it a whole different thing when after they practice to go back and study again. Buddhism isn't very attractive if you don't understand, if you don't have the clarity of mind to appreciate it. Many people's spirituality is meant to be a still a pleasure seeking experience.
for others it's a philosophical debate or intellectual exercise and so there's different reasons why I learn to appreciate the Buddha's teaching important to keep or have an intention of that I don't know if you want to reach this or that level of attainment can be helpful determination can be a helpful thing I don't know that it has to be explicitly uh, stated or determined in your mind some people just have greater uh, conviction or greater uh, momentum so when they get to a certain level it, it just becomes a little bit they become a little bit maybe not complacent but content whereas other people are pushing further greater momentum uh, in some cases it might not have been explicitly thought in their mind I want to reach this level or that level but the Buddha just sees that they have the potential or they they have the momentum to, to reach there quite quickly so when some people when they reach a certain state they get stuck there and that might be all they reach in this lifetime and just lose the momentum so some of the people is, uh, would have been uh, already uh, sort of and uh, have attained some uh, attainment and they are hoping for the next stage and listening to this uh, uh, help them attain that maybe that could be the case yeah so can guess that uh, they are all um, just putukjan or maybe some of them had already attained certain level I mean, I guess uh, what I'm asking is that uh, just having an intention, like I feel like uh, equanimously or with wisdom, you know, that's the next step or that's the next goal. Uh, instead of like, I heard people really being obsessed about the, the next uh, thing and the next thing. And I mean, I think that's obstructive for them, right? That attitude. I think. I'm just asking. Well, obsession is just the not way, not the right attitude. Well, I, I don't know if that's even true. I mean, the word obsession can mean different things. If you're single-minded about it, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Oh. If you're, you're, you're attached to it, like you want it. You know, the reason why people often become obsessive is, is ego. They want to be something that can be quite be distorted in their mind if you have single-minded focus on it it's, that's not necessarily bad it's like when you wash a uh, cloth uh, okay it is uh, cleaned up up to a certain level and then you notice there's more dirt in the cloth okay now i need to wash this too so that's a goal which is a good goal mentioned in the 11th paragraph, uh, what uh, Judy was saying was different from what I understood. Like I say, I understood from this and uh, that uh, when, when attachment is uh, cut, right, cut, cut from these sense objects or sense of uh, feelings or even consciousness uh, to experience these uh, things, these sexual things. It's like it's like when the attachment or the wanting is cut off, right? So even though an, an enlightened being still have to has to experience these uh, sensual things, but the hide is no longer um, connected to its inner, it's not even connected. So that's what I understand from this. Yeah, I got this meaning. No attachment after cutting off. Yeah. And in paragraph 13, there is a mention about 
entering and abiding in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom. Um, and when I search for the word de deliverance in the English dictionary, it says the action of being rescued or set free. What does deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom mean? And what's the difference um, between the two? They are, one is through the practice of samatha first, the other is just by the practice of vipassana. So jeto, jeto vimuti means uh, through through the attainment of the jhana citta, the samatha jhana citta, to adi citta, the, the, a specific state of mind. Not deliverance by mind, but deliverance by specific, or by using certain specific states of mind. Thank you, Bhatta. Can lay people become our hunts? But it would usually be in the case where someone wasn't able to become, someone is choosing not to become a monk and living an ordinary lay life. Not really, it's not really likely that in many cases where someone would become an arahant and then ordain. Uh, to, to add to the previous question, uh, Cheto Vimukti in the highest sense means the concentration of an arahant or concentration of the arahant, the mind of the arahant. In the sense, it is the jhana, but uh, in the highest sense, arahant, concentration. Well, when paired with panya, we bring to those two different. Panya is wrong. You, is more specifically, uh, Sakaya Diti, the most dangerous quote unquote thing in samsara. Does it make sense? There's something called niyatamicha, un permanent, unshakable. It's the worst one. Yeah, Sakaya Diti doesn't prevent you from, uh, it doesn't block your path to enlightenment, but near the majority can. Uh, so that can could be considered. Like for religious people who, who are convinced or have convinced themselves of something that is where are following it because of their religion, like they identify with the view. This is my view. It is called Magavara. There's another one called Sakavara, which is uh, View, which are views that uh, block the path to heavens, Sagavaran and then Magavaran, views that uh, block the path to enlightenment. So why do we then say Sakaraditi is eradicated at Sotapana and not this one you mentioned? Is it because it falls under that? It's eradicated uh, at Sotapana, but it doesn't prevent you from reaching to that level, like a person who has near the Michaditi, he won't even try your practice to go up to that level. A person who has Sankhayaditi, he, he will practice, he would uh, want freedom from suffering and he uh, uh, do awesome things. But near the Michaditi, a person who has it uh, wouldn't. So it's like a person who has no Sankhayaditi has much less of the this one you, you you're talking about well they couldn't have any wrong yeah but like if someone has the view that suffering and happiness are caused by god part of god's plan or they'll never commit themselves to be interested in that that many people grew up with that view and and they maybe have that view but they can be dissuaded of it when they're told that that's not the case or that they practice a little bit and see that that's not the case they can give it up but if someone is adamant in them, they'll, they'll never give it up. They'll never be able to see the truth. Yeah, that's why some people, when you start, uh, start to introduce Buddhism to some person, the first question you get is, do you believe in God? Say no. <laughs> End of conversation. Yeah, we don't believe in a, in a God the way they think of it. We might just say that, well, gods are, gods are just beings. They're not what you think they are omnipotent they're not omniscient they don't do the things that you think maybe some of the things i mean gods may in devas anyway in human realms sometimes on their whim the venerable nanda nandaka uh, mentions of the seven enlightened factors and then he says which is supported by seclusion dispassion and cessation so I understand, of course, seclusion, this passion, but what would be this cessation part? But 
Is it, is it the fruition uh, attainment or? Sort of, I think probably. It's a little more general. I think the Buddha is talking about the process in general. And though the commentary likes to give very specific meanings to things, it's a little more rhetorical. So he's talking generally about cessation. And the cessation is he's alluding to is going to the experience of Nibbana. But of course, like technically, it it uh, still counts, right? That uh, the more you see nibbana, the more likely it is that you are going to get the next path and fruition, right? Not just more likely. Sure. Thank you. I, I was a little bit surprised of of this uh, commentary part there, uh, still with the thirteenth paragraph that he says that wisdom basically is not enough. I was like, what? And then when he uh, enumerates all the enlightenment factors, it, it makes sense. But, I mean, it's still wisdom that cuts off everything, right? Wisdom here means Dhamma which is... Uh, is Investigation. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a good point that uh, saying that wisdom isn't enough is a bit. It might be more accurate to say that wisdom isn't strong enough or isn't isn't going to adequately develop. Because the other factors also they they have a job to do and uh, wisdom cannot do their job like really uh, sati. I feel I feel like all the others help wisdom to culminate right to to even wisdom or recognition or seeing clearly happen. Right? All the others help it. Like tranquility, energy, yeah, The commentary doesn't quite say what he says. Uh, what, is, what, is, what does he translate it as? Isn't alone I'm, able to, it isn't alone able to cut the defilement. Not without the other six is. is Wisdom able to. I mean, wisdom isn't really able to arise. Wisdom is in seeing clearly, and you need all these other factors in order to see clearly. I think it would have made a difference if he mentioned that it also could be sati, which cuts, uh, and uh, it wouldn't, it couldn't do its job without the other factors. It's not really the case. Uh, sati is what, sati is like the hand that grabs the, the sheaf of wheat, and panya is like the knife that cuts the wheat. And you can't cut it if you don't grasp it. Try to cut wheat without grabbing onto it. It just bends and just goes with the knife. But if you grab it and then you cut, then it gets cut. And uh, samadhi is the force applied, right? But instead of just placing the knife had to apply some force um, so in the in the beginning um there is yeah in the note the note uh, 13 it says that andaka had all these beaconies uh, as con concubines what what are those what? The, 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 uh, women that prior to be with hire would not just hire i guess own thing would own it's like harem harem yeah oh jeez okay but they don't have the status of wife like there would be the queen but then they're, uh, it's just men making, making up rules oh my goodness yeah i mean the, the, these words only have meaning because men decided that it was okay because they had all the power but it's uh, so interesting that they still come together even when they are uh, coming enlightened. Like, uh, they still meet each other. Right. It's like if you are a king, you, are, you can have more than one. Uh, like you have the main queen, like Mathis said, the queen and then pleasure girls. 
Mahdi is the Pamuka, is the, the leader, right? Whatever you're focused on, that's the direction you're going to go in. So the you point the car in a certain direction, it's going to go in that direction. So samadhi is the thing that any inertia that pushes you in that direction. You can't suddenly decide to go in a different direction. That's what samadhi is. That's when when you in, when you incline in a certain way, get stuck on it. Yeah, it's you're slow to change because of samadhi. Samadhi is uh, the guiding force, the force, the guiding force. Sati is the adipate, adipateya, uh, chief or the leader. So sati is like the steering wheel, or it's like the, oh yeah, like the steering wheel. It's what determines which which direction you incline towards with samadhi. Panya is the, the the top. So panya is like the head or the the eyes or the the driver. Let's say panya is the driver that it uses the steering wheel to direct the car. I have a question about the past lives. So it seems that the Bikunis, they were women in their past lives and they were reborn as women. And uh, uh, Nandika, he was uh, he was a man in his previous life. He was reborn as a man again. And uh, it seems like a common theme. Why, is, uh, why do people tend to be reborn as the same gender over and over again? Is there a reason? Well, habit. I mean, if you think uh, a man acts in certain ways in this life, I mean, genders are, as we, we talk about nowadays, genders are are socially constructed to some extent, right? And so you, you're reaffirming narratives, you're reaffirming identities throughout your life, right? An ordinary masculine man is going to be taught how to be a man, it's going to act like a man. A woman is going to be taught how a woman should act. And as a result, when they pass away, they're, they're stuck. With the, this is the samadhi, right? They're stuck in that, with that inertia. So it, it's more interesting when it changes. Like, wow, what happened that this person flipped the narrative and is suddenly um, something that they're not accustomed to? That would require a person to go contrary to the norm. If a, if a, um, yeah, I mean, simple, it's simplistic, but if a man starts acting effeminate or um, inclines to be like a woman, like what we think of as a woman, they're likely to be reborn as. The thing is, I guess you could say some men and women are born, like some men are born very effeminate, some women are born, born very masculine very uh, the opposite of a feminine it's, it's complicated but uh, sex is is is, gen- is genetic right it's obviously a, it's a physical thing it's probably a lot less related most of the time to well, that's not fair to say but it's uh, well yeah the actual gender is or the actual sex is well, it's got to be related to the, the karma yes it's a karmic uh, matter karma jarupa yeah. But both the inclination, like liking the gender, and I just asked this question in the in the Abhidhamma study group. Yeah, it's determined at both at the conception, sure. Yeah, and I just meant to say it's disconnected from the the uh, the nature of the person, uh, the depth. I mean, it's just not a very deep thing. It's just a switch, right? It's an A or B thing, and you fall on this line, side of the line, or, but that, that doesn't doesn't determine. Uh, I mean, it determines so much, kind of unfairly so, because it doesn't really describe individuals. Because so, again, so men differ greatly and women differ greatly from each other. It shows that we're kind of uh, in a bit of a prison in a lot in so many ways. We're not uh, we're not able to navigate. And control things in any way. Just be stuck, and this is why there's this issue when people are noticing gender dysphoria, where they just don't feel comfortable because they got on the wrong side of the fence. I mean, different from what they're used, to, they're accustomed to life after life after life, and so it's very uncomfortable to be a certain sex. I mean, the, the discomfort, of course, from a Buddhist perspective, doesn't come from that. It comes from the reactions to not being able to cope and the, the, the liking of something, the disliking of something. It's not a reason to 
transition. It's a reason to let go. It's a reason to cultivate wisdom, to see that we're not under, we're not in, in control. Yeah, it is possible that people who likes the uh, who, who are attracted to the same danger could have been the opposite gender in a uh, recent previous life. So they are used to that and suddenly when the body changed, they can't uh, yeah. make the switch. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Buddhism, a Buddhist should be should be sensitive and, and respectful towards people who have transitioned, but um, we, we can't really, and can sympathize, but can't agree with, I mean, I just don't agree that it, it, it's not something that we would do or recommend someone to, because it, it relates to self. I mean, you want to become the person who you believe you are, um, and, and it's not to say that you're wrong in that belief, but it's that it's just still just belief in self, or it's still just clinging to self, and it just makes things worse. It doesn't actually fix the issue. Thank you, Bonte. I was taught in college that alcoholism is a disease, not a choice. And I was wondering, should we condemn people who drink because they're alcoholics, or... Is it you think, you think we should condemn people for having a disease? Yes. You shouldn't condemn people for having a disease. You shouldn't condemn people for having made a choice either. I mean, you shouldn't condemn people. That's just not a... I mean, why would you want to do that? Unkind. Thank you. Are addictions classified as diseases? That's a strange way to put it, I think, alcoholism. Well, they're, they're, it actually is interesting because it... It it hints at the idea that or the recognition that they're out of one's control, and because doctors are seeing that it's not really a choice, people can't just one day decide to be an alcoholic and the next day decide, nah, today I won't be. They don't really have that luxury. They're noticing that. I mean, that's what they what they see, and so they classify things. So these classifications have nothing to do with Buddhism. They don't have any real intrinsic meaning. But there is an interesting thing that. They must be noticing is that there's an element of non-self there that they're not in control. Addicts are not really in control, and we would say it's mainly because of lack of clarity. And addiction muddles the mind. Until you create the clarity, you can free yourself from the. But doctors, of course, want to prescribe drugs and stuff. That's a big reason, often, often, or sometimes a big reason for classifying things as diseases. We can medicate it, or we can treat it, or that's... I have um, also heard this alcoholism is a disease thing, and um, I gathered it was because alcohol withdrawal, it can potentially be deadly based on the severity. Well, I mean, I think it's... it's it's. I mean, it's good to calling it a disease. I mean, that is what it is. It is a... These things are... I mean, greed and anger and delusion are also diseases. Roga. There's sickness. Calling them that is better than calling them what a choice or a, I mean, I guess they're kind of shying away from the idea of it being a mental illness, like alcoholism being a mental issue. And to call it a physical issue, I mean, it certainly can be comforting to say, oh, I'm, I, I'm not to blame, it's just my body. But that's not really accurate. But but there is a physical component. Certainly your body becomes addicted to alcohol as well. Not addicted, but your body becomes um, altered as a result of lots of alcohol and there can be lots of discomfort when you don't have what you what you're addicted to withdrawal uh just just on the same way um like i'm thinking of uh, like gambling is that can that be also an addiction like i hear yeah. someone who could so not stop all the disease but but what what it's there is no physical substance altering the body no, or there is, is it like and probably similar hormone? to alcohol go ahead is it a hormone like serotonin uh, or something know. yeah are those hormones I don't know those are called hormones but like mental chem mind chemicals that's all I know yeah I mean I think alcohol has a mental component like there's mental 
chemicals, brain chemicals. So I think it's not that dissimilar from some, I mean, quite dissimilar and in some ways not so dissimilar from alcohol. And, or I, I don't know too much about alcohol. I was surprised to learn how addictive it can be. But uh, other drugs like nicotine, very addictive, heroin. Yeah, so that's why I'm asking the gambling part because I don't understand, like, how is that still called an addiction? Well, the word addiction just means you're addicted to it, right? You can't stop. That's what that, you're what they're kind of saying is that, yeah, what they're saying is that addiction is, is you can't stop, is that it's, it's organic. I would say it's physical, like there's a physical basis to it. We would say there's a physical component to it, but more we would say it's organic, which means even though it, the addiction is primarily mental, it's still organic. It, it doesn't mean that just because it's mental, you can switch it on and off. Mind is also an organic, meaning it's messy, it's uncontrollable, it's non-self, it's, and it's connected to the body. So when the body suffers, you... You reinforce your addiction. You you say, oh, I better get what I'm addicted to or else I'm going to suffer because you don't like that bodily. So gambling could be very similar. You don't feel pleased. You don't feel pleasure because you're not gambling and you crave that. When you don't have it, then you think, oh, I have to go and indulge in my addiction to be happy and get pleasure again. So there's still a physical component. Thank you, Bante. Uh, but Julie not has... like alcohol. Alcohol being a physical thing and drugs being physical yeah. things, it's gambling is much, I would say, less likely or less common to lead to serious issues. And it does, of course, lead to very serious issues for some people, but I'd say my guess is probably far less common. It's just not as direct as drugs and alcohol. Um, with uh, being uh, like uh, addicted and uh, or like a It reminds me of like attachment and clinging and how like certain things that we enjoy because I have like some habits that are hard to kick and they're not alcohol, but they're just, it's just annoying. Like certain things that I like to eat or drink um, and I'm not breaking a precept, but I find that like with causes and conditions that there are many, like um, it's kind of like, I see like I break like a cause or something like like that chain, I'll break it, but then there's like, it comes from like other directions. So I find that's why it's like a little bit hard to kick, but to get rid of the habit, but I don't know if I'm accurate in that or if it's just a false idea that I have. Well, you just pay attention and you'll see, you don't, you don't want to develop negatives, like it is like this or it is like that, or this is how it happens. Don't don't create stories, but but notice and... If you don't know, then pay better attention and you'll, you'll see more. You don't have to go speculating, I guess. But if you don't see that it's like this or it's like that, then don't worry about it. Focus on what you do see. I mean, it's it's a, unless you're doing intensive meditation practice, it's a long-term process, a long-term project. Something that slowly in your life you're going to start to see if you're mindful. So one of my questions is, it's kind of like a, there's several parts to it, but it's about conceit. So I'm wondering if conceit is a result of thinking one is in control. If um, Is there a relationship between conceit and control? And also, I just wanted to clarify that um, conceit in Buddhist terms, I believe, is comparison like better than and less than. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I bring up conceit is because I see like it's one of the the final things like the arahant um, that up until Arahant, like the other stages, see? Conceit is connected to things like worry, worrying that you're not good enough, connected to things like greed, when you feel, when you like feeling superior, that sort of thing, connected to self, when you have ideas of who you are, create narratives of your station in life, who you're equal to, who you're better than. So it's more complicated than just saying it's related to one thing or another. But it, it's, it's its own thing. It's the comparison and what comes from seeing or having a sense of self. So the proximate cause of Kansi Domana is uh, mentioned as uh, greed, yeah. greedy, jittas, without uh, uh, wrong view. 
or without Ditti, mentioned in the Dhammasangani Atua Chittapata section. Thank you, Bhante. My other question is, is it possible that in our previous life, we plan to work towards enlightenment before we were born, but don't remember that? Of course, yes. And it's, often, it's quite likely that many, many of us, or that we all had some experiences that led us here. And it's vague. It's so vague. I mean, it's, it's certain that we had experiences that led us here. But some of them may have been significant, and some of them may have been very Buddhist in nature, very connected with Buddhism. It's so very important to meet with and to make a connection with Buddhist teaching and to make so, sort of a determination in your mind for your future, give you this narrative or this this story, this uh, journey that you can follow, this path you can follow conceptually that will lead you to be born, lead you to be born in a place that you can make another connection with the Buddhist teaching. All right, I guess we'll stop there then. Have a good week, everyone. Uh, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Have a good week, everyone.